Hypothesis testing identifies whether an effect exists in a population. It does not, however, inform us of how big the effect is. Researchers tend to be interested in big effects, but hypothesis testing by itself can create an illusion of exaggerated importance. A very small difference found using a very large sample can be statistically significant because sample size strongly influences the outcomes of hypothesis testing. A small difference between a sample mean and a population mean might not be statistically significant with a small sample, but it could be statistically significant with a somewhat larger sample, and it would almost certainly be statistically significant with an extremely large sample. But just because a real difference exists does not mean it's a large or meaningful difference. In short, statistical significance does not indicate practical importance. So if we reject the null hypothesis, all we really see is that there's a significant effect of our treatment. In other words, the changes observed were not due to chance. This says nothing about how substantial or how big the effect is. For example, we could research into how quickly M&Ms melt in your hand. We run through the hypothesis testing procedure and do our experiment. Our results show that red M&Ms melt significantly faster than the other colours. We found a significant result. But how substantial an effect is it? Let's say it turns out that red M&Ms melt 0.74 seconds faster than any other colour. The effect size of the red colour is small. It's statistically significant, but nonetheless trivial. A statistically significant finding, particularly one from a study using a large sample, may indicate a genuine difference between groups, but a trivial one, with no real-world application. This is where effect size comes in. Effect size indicates the absolute magnitude of a difference, and is unaffected by sample size. It's recommended that whenever researchers report a statistically significant effect, they also provide the report of the effect size. There are many different effect size statistics, but they all neutralize the influence of sample size. One of the simplest and most direct methods for measuring effect size is called Cohen's D. It's named after Jacob Cohen, who was an American statistician and psychologist at NYU who proposed this method for measuring effect size. Cohen's D equals the difference between the sample mean and the population mean divided by the standard deviation. Cohen proposed these rules of thumb for interpreting effect size. However, Cohen also warned that they may be different for each field of study. Let's go through an example. A researcher is investigating the effectiveness of a new medication for lowering the blood pressure of individuals with a systolic pressure greater than 140 millimeters of mercury. For this population, systolic scores average 160, with a standard deviation of 20, and the scores form a normal shape distribution. The researcher selects a sample of n equals 500 individuals and measures their systolic pressure after they take the medication for 60 days. He finds a sample mean of 157, and using an alpha level of 0.05, finds a statistically significant decrease. He's thrilled. With a sample of n equals 500, the standard error of the mean is 0.89, and our z-score is minus 3.37. For an alpha level of 0.05, the critical regions would begin at z equals plus or minus 1.96. The z-score is beyond the minus 1.96 boundary, so the researcher rejects the null hypothesis and concludes that there's a significant effect. Now consider the outcome if a sample of n equals 25 had been used instead. With a sample of 25, the standard error is 4, and our z-score is minus 0.75. This z-score fails to reach the critical region, so the researcher fails to reject the null hypothesis. Here the three-point difference between the sample mean and the population mean is considered to be insignificant because it's being compared to a standard error of 4 versus a standard error of 0.89. Let's measure Cohen's D to measure the effect size of this treatment. 
Cohen's d equals 157 minus 160 divided by 20, which equals 0 0.15. Using Cohen's rules of thumb, this would be interpreted as a small effect size. And that makes sense. There's no real life medical application for giving a population of hypertensive patients a drug that only lowers their blood pressure by three points. Going from 160 millimeters of mercury to 157 isn't going to help them. They're still going to be hypertensive. Hypothesis testing seeks to learn more about the value of a parameter in a population of interest by deciding whether to retain or reject an all hypothesis. We can also learn this information by using an alternative technique called estimation. Estimation does not require that we state an all hypothesis and decide whether it should be rejected. We use estimation to measure the mean in a sample, as we did in hypothesis testing, but instead of making a decision regarding an all hypothesis, we estimate the limits within which the population mean is likely to be contained. The use of estimation is common in the popular media. There are two types of estimation. The point estimate is a single number used to estimate the population parameter, whereas the interval estimate provides a range of plausible values. Let's go through an example. A research study has demonstrated that self-hypnosis can be an effective treatment for allergies. A sample of patients with moderate to severe allergic reactions were trained to focus their minds in a specific place where allergies do not bother them such as a ski slope in winter. The participants were then tested for allergic reactions to pollen with and without using self-hypnosis. This sample of n equals 16 had a mean decrease in allergic reaction of 21%. We could use this data to estimate how much effect self-hypnosis would have on the general population of individuals with moderate to severe allergies. So a point estimate would take the sample mean of 21% and infer that the population would also see a 21% decrease in allergic reaction. Whereas the interval estimate would take the sample mean of 21% and infer that the population would see a decrease in allergic reaction of somewhere between 18 and 24%. In October 2012, Quinnipiac University's Polling Institute surveyed likely voters in Colorado, Virginia and Wisconsin to ask them the following question. If the election for president were being held today and the candidates were Barack Obama the Democrat and Mitt Romney the Republican, for whom would you vote? The following data were the results of surveying these samples. 47% of the Colorado sample said they would vote for Obama. 48% said they would vote for Romney. 2% said they would vote for someone else and 2% said they didn't know who they would vote for. A point estimate would take the sample data and infer that the voting percentages would be true of all likely voters in Colorado, whereas the interval estimate would take the reported margin of error of plus or minus 2.8% and estimate a range of plausible values for this population of likely voters. In February 2013, Quinnipiac University's Polling Institute surveyed 1,011 Ohio registered voters to ask the question, from what you've heard or read, do you think the 2010 health care law will mostly help you personally, will mostly hurt you personally, or don't you think it will have much of an effect on you personally? The following data are the results of that survey. This figure represents some of the interval estimates that infer how the democratic the Republican, the Independent, the White, or the Black populations of Ohio would respond to this question. Hypothesis testing and estimation both use sample statistics to find something out about an unknown population. Hypothesis testing provides yes-no information on whether an effect exists, whereas estimation provides information about the magnitude of an effect. Estimation should be used in the following circumstances. After a hypothesis test where the null hypothesis has been rejected to find out the magnitude of the effect. Or when it's already known that there's an effect but you want to find out how substantial it is. Or when you want to gather some basic information about a population. To review, 
A summary statistic such as the sample mean is used as a point estimate of the population mean. A more useful estimate is the interval estimate. This provides a range of plausible numbers for the population mean. The most commonly used interval estimate is the confidence interval, which can be created by subtracting and adding a margin of error from a mean, and is used to indicate the reliability of an estimate. The confidence interval is stated within a given level of confidence, for example, 80% or 90% or 95%. This is the likelihood that an interval contains the unknown population mean. Exactly how confident we are depends on the level of confidence chosen. The 95% confidence level is the most commonly used. A lot of similar sounding terminology surrounds confidence intervals. The confidence interval is the interval or range of possible values within which an unknown population parameter is likely to be contained. The level of confidence is the probability or likelihood that an interval estimate will contain an unknown population parameter, whereas confidence limits are the upper and lower boundaries of a confidence interval given within a specified level of confidence. So for example, a researcher reports from a sample of 35 individuals that 34% of Americans plus or minus 3% believe in ghosts. The 95% confidence interval is 31% to 37%. If independent samples are taken repeatedly from the same population and a confidence interval calculated for each sample, then a certain percentage of the intervals will include the unknown population parameter. This is what we mean by confidence level. Confidence intervals are usually calculated so that this percentage is 95%. But we can produce confidence intervals for the unknown parameter using any level of confidence 90%, 99%, 99.9%, .9%, whichever we choose. For example, suppose an opinion poll predicted that 38% of Americans believe that professional athletes are good role models for children. The pollster might attach a 95% confidence level to the interval 38% plus or minus 4%. That is, they think it's very likely that if asked, between 34% and 42% of the whole US population would consider athletes as good role models. The width of the confidence interval gives us some idea about how uncertain we are regarding the unknown parameter. A very wide interval may indicate that more data should be collected before anything very definite can be said about the parameter. Confidence intervals are more informative than the simple results of hypothesis tests, since they provide a range of plausible values for the unknown parameter. Confidence intervals get larger or wider the higher the level of confidence that's desired. On the other hand, they get smaller or narrower the larger the sample size. When we use estimation to find the confidence interval, we can also refer to the precision of the interval. Precision, or reproducibility, or repeatability, is the degree to which repeated measures under unchanged conditions result in the same estimate. In other words, how free the estimate is from random variation. The wider the confidence interval, the less precise the estimate. High variability means a large standard error, and therefore an imprecise estimate of the true population mean. Precision should be distinguished from accuracy. Accuracy is the degree of closeness of an estimate to the population's true value. In other words, how free the estimate is from systematic error or bias. An estimate can be accurate but not precise. It can be precise but not accurate. It can be neither or it can be both. The ideal situation is to have an estimate that has no systematic error or significant random variation and therefore is both accurate and precise. The width of the confidence interval decreases in proportion to the square root of the sample size. So to double the precision of an estimate, sample size must be multiplied by 4. To triple precision, it must be multiplied by 9. And to quadruple precision, sample size must be multiplied by 16. 
Increasing the precision of research therefore requires disproportionate increases in sample size. Thus, very precise research is expensive and time-consuming.